call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's uh, viewing the meeting on G10 television. And uh, we're going to begin our meeting tonight uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mayor Pro Tem Jerry Bittner, followed by the invocation by John Carter, our city attorney. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Heavenly Father, we pause again this evening to give you thanks. To give you thanks for the continued blessings that you so graciously bestow upon each of us and upon, and upon our city. We are in a pandemic. We still have an opioid crisis. We have social racial and economic divide, and the list goes on. We pray that each of us would be less opinionated and more empathetic, that we would be less to judge and seek more to understand. We pray for our nation. We pray for healing and peace, and we know that that will only come when it comes from you. We pray for our military who are standing watch this evening, keeping us safe, for their anxious families. And as always, we pray for our mayor and for our council, that your guidance and direction would be with them. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. 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 Tonight, uh, Council Member Brian Jackson is going to be joining us via Zoom, and uh, he's unable to physically be here to, tonight. John, if you would give us a little bit of a yes, sir. briefing on. Previously, the Council adopted, uh, as part of your uh, rules of procedure, to have electronic meetings. And Mr. Jackson, as you've indicated, is joining us tonight, uh, the ICE meeting or uh, Microsoft meetings or some, some system. He's there on the screen. We can actually see him and speak to him. Uh, this authority that y'all were given was given by the North Carolina State Legislature. And it's not given to be out there for everyday use. It's only during a period of time when the governor has declared a state of emergency, which as you all know, that we are still under a state of emergency with the pandemic in North Carolina and throughout the United States. Part of uh, this electronic meetings has special rules, and we're going to get into those a little bit tonight because especially of the public hearing that you're going to be having here in a few moments. But the first thing, Mayor, of course, we have to always make sure that Mr. Jackson's there and that he is, has uh, an ample opportunity to participate and that we know his vote on everything from adopting the agenda to approving the minutes and certainly the consent agenda and the two public hearings that we'll go through here in a moment. One of the unique things about electronic meetings that the North Carolina statute sets forth that's going to affect us, everyone, y'all and uh, us as staff, is that when you have a public hearing such as you're having tonight, that after the public hearing and after y'all vote whatever the motion may be, well, there's actually two. One is on the food trucks and the other one is on landscaping and industrial zones. But after you have the public hearing and y'all uh, entertain a motion or that you do mayor and that y'all vote on it, it does not, be, even if it's a unanimous vote, it does not immediately become effective. There's a 24 hour period after the hearing before it becomes effective. And that period is for people to submit written comments to the clerk if they want to uh, comment on it. Now, if there's no comments in that 24 hour period, then at the end of that, let's say seven o'clock tomorrow night or something like that, then uh, that particular ordinance will become effective. If there's comments, then that will be returned to you at a subsequent meeting for you to hear those comments and to vote again on that motion. Another interesting point here, and we, Carmen and I have not talked to you about it because you all pretty much have been unanimous on ordinances and things, but there, you have one tonight. There may not be unanimity. So I want to go ahead and, and talk to you about ordinances and what's required. On an ordinance such as the food truck and also as the landscaping in the industrial zone, it requires a two-thirds majority 
in order to be passed at just one sitting, one reading here tonight. You're having your first reading. There's five, five, of, five of you here tonight. Of course, the mayor only votes in cases of ties, so there's five members. Four of you would have to support whatever motion is put on the floor. If four of you do it, then you've got the two-thirds of the five uh, there. You don't count the, the seat that's vacant that we are elected not to appoint someone to. So again, if there's only three to two a vote, then that's not your two-thirds. So that wouldn't be passed tonight, but rather would have to come back at a subsequent meeting for you to consider. At that meeting, if it's passed three to two, then it becomes the law. But you do require a two-thirds majority. Now, I know I've gone over that pretty quickly, but would be glad to entertain any questions. Questions? So everything you've mentioned here is in relation to the electronic meeting aspect of it? Everything, it, 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 you know, the, the last part about the ordinance part, as far as the two-thirds majority, even if Mr. Jackson was here, that would be the, the law. That is the law. And it's been like that the whole yes, time? Yes, sir. And, and we, we, we believe we've caught everything that y'all have, again, pretty much been unanimous up to this point, but that's correct. If it's, it has to be a two-thirds vote. Even if there were six of you, and Mr. Lozaro was here, or whoever sat in his seat, that would still require the four. You'd have to have four, whether there's five or six of you, to have the two-thirds majority. But again, if it's three, two on an ordinance, uh, then it would have to have a second reading, as they call it, and be passed again, at least by three, two. And again, it could become law, it wouldn't, but, but you do have to have that second reading. Does that go back to the, I'm familiar with the first and second readings on ordinances. Yes, you sir. could do a first and second reading in one night, though? No, sir, I, I believe it has to be done at a, a subsequent meeting. That's my understanding. But again, uh, just wanted to, not that we're not trying to jinx anything. We hope it, whatever, the, you know, you'll be in unanimity or you'll at least have four of the five of you. So it will become effective tonight, except it won't become effective tonight because it'll have to wait the 24 hours. Again, if there's comments, then we will return it to you at a subsequent meeting, probably the first or second meeting in February. So there's a couple of wrinkles here that we're, you know, having to deal with. And we'll try to guide you through them as we go through it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, John. All right, next we have the adoption of the agenda for tonight's meeting. Everybody should have an opportunity to look at the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Next we have, the, uh, we have our uh, public comment for this evening, and I have no one signed up uh, for public comment. So we're going to go ahead and uh, look at adoption of the minutes and consent items. There's six consent items on the agenda for tonight. Uh, the minutes are from January 5th, 2021, regular workshop meeting. Move for the adoption of the minutes and consent items. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All aye. All right, so we're going to go now to uh, our public hearing. Be item number seven on the agenda. And this is a <clears throat> public hearing on the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment uh, Amendment to Article 4, Use and Standards, and Section 4.3, Accessory Use Standards, and Article 9.4, Definitions Associated with Food Vendor tr Standards, which would allow food uh, food trucks. And Ryan King will be presenting this item. Ryan. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Councilman Jackson, Elton, on the internet. <clears throat> I, I experienced that uh, at our planning board, uh, so I've been where he's sitting last week. So it worked well, though. We thought that it was definitely a nice tool to have versus having a delayed city business. Um, tonight on item seven, we have a unified development ordinance amendment. The issue that we have is that we've had a citizen or a group of citizens request that the unified development ordinance be amended to allow food trucks or food trailers. The, to give council a little bit of history, the unified development ordinance, which is the current ordinance that we are utilizing was adopted in 2014. Food trucks were not listed as a permitted use. The only thing that was allowed is a food cart. So like the hot dog vendor that's within the building footprint under the Lowe's canopy, 
that's basically the only thing that the ordinance currently allows. So it's not conducive for larger vehicles such as the food trucks and the trailers. We do allow uh, food vendors with special events. So uh, your Oktoberfest, your National Night Out, all the events. Uh, if a business decides to have a customer appreciation event, there are certain things that businesses can have with a special event permit that uh, they would be allowed to participate in and sell their goods there. Uh, as council recalls, uh, back, I believe it was April of 2020, we had some of the, the mobile food vendors actually participate in our public comment session here at city council and asked that city council consider it. As a result of that, uh, staff had conversations with the applicant and they submitted that official request to amend the code, which is why we're here before you tonight. Um, based on that, we had discussions with vendors. We then brought uh, forth to the planning board for a discussion as well as city council. Uh, based on what staff had presented previously, uh, we went back and we revised that proposal. So this proposal tonight does not include an overlay zone. It does not include, um, you know, that additional element. So basically anywhere, and we'll get into the standards here in just a moment, but anywhere that's zoned appropriately, if they can meet the standards, they would be able to operate. So tonight we are here for the consideration of that amendment. Planning board recommended approval last Monday, and then we're here tonight and we do have some individuals that, that would like to speak during the public comment session or the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So the standards for um, food vendors, we are gonna have to amend as we have proposed. Uh, we took what they had requested and then we tweaked it based on staff's input what we felt needed to be put in the ordinance to address concerns that we have. Uh, they would be able to operate in the corridor commercial or industrial zones. It requires a definition to be amended. Then we had created, uh, we modified the current standards for the food vendors carts to accommodate the food trucks. This table here is not, this is kind of a paraphrase, um, we're paraphrasing the standards. The standards specifically are written in the ordinance that you have before you in attachment A. Attachment B is what the applicant requested, but to kind of just generally go over the standards, you would be able to have one vendor per lot. There'd be 250 foot spacing from another food vendor or restaurant, so from the parcel. So to make sure that we don't have them on every single parcel or direct conflict with restaurants is a 250 foot spacing from the parcel. Uh, no site alterations allowed for these um, food vendors. Um, the time limit, which is kind of a, not really sure why we have a time limit, but when we looked at other ordinances, most cities and towns allowed 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. So there's, a, there's almost 24 hours a day they'd be able to operate. Uh, the ordinance is gonna require that they clean the areas daily, provide trash receptacles. Uh, obviously we, as council is familiar with, we have lighting standards. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't treat our food vendors if approved any differently than we do our bricks and mortar restaurants. So we would expect them to have dark sky standards, just like our businesses do. Um, they would have to have all county health department approvals. Uh, there's an owner documentation piece in here that requires the food vendor to get an, a notarized statement from the property owner, giving them permission to locate on the property. Uh, of the items that staff had discussions with the applicant, Mr. Joey, uh, I hope I don't say his, wrong, wrong, his name wrong, but Lissy uh, Lissy Whiskey, I believe, Basically, the only concern that we weren't able to kind of address was they had some questions about, well, do you really want to require that it be notarized? Staff, we have our convictions on that. We want to see a notarized statement because these food vendors may be on a piece of property after hours. So when the business is closed, they may set up in the parking lot. We don't want to try to run down the property owner. We want to see a notarized statement that says you have permission to be there. Um, these permits are going to be good for a year. So, you know, we think that that's, that may be the only sticking point based on our discussions that we've had uh, with the back and forth since November with the applicant. Um, so as I mentioned, an annual permit, it would be from July 1 till June 30. Uh, these vendors also require to have their hoods inspected uh, from the fire department. So they will have to make sure that their equipment has been inspected. We wanna make sure that they don't set up too close to a fire hydrant where they block our emergency services personnel from being able to access to put out a fire. <coughs> there is a, a setback from fire hydrants. Uh, some noise prohibitions. We wanna make sure that they're not using amplified sounds to draw customers their way. Obviously a generator 
you know, is not going to be under that restriction. And then we also had outdoor seating prohibited. If a business already has outdoor seating, then that's fine if they use it. We just don't want them bringing picnic tables and other chairs and tables uh, to set up there. And then the rest pertains to sign standards. Uh, we actually brought the five by five A-frame sign as an allowable type sign. Uh, that's actually what Swansboro had in their ordinance. We actually borrowed that from Swansboro. Uh, menu boards on the trucks. <coughs> Basically anything that's on the truck or trailer. I mean, if it's 100% 100% signage, that's going to be allowed because it's kind of hard to to regulate that. And so if it's on the vehicle, as long as it doesn't go above or beside or below, it's on the 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 wall of the, of the trailer or the, the, the vehicle, it would be acceptable, uh, which is kind of ties into the height restriction. Uh, just like we don't allow electronic message centers on our bricks and mortar restaurants, we don't want them on the food trucks either, so that would be prohibited, as well as the LED rope strings of lights that we prohibit in the city of Jackson as well. We wouldn't want to see them on the food vendor. So just trying to make sure that we bring over the other standards that our bricks and mortars have to deal with to make sure that it's clear with the food vendors. Um, and then to kind of jump ahead to the agenda item nine, which we'll come back to in a few moments, but the applicant requested a $200 annual application fee, I believe it is, as you'll find in attachment B. Um, staff is recommending that it be a $500 annual fee. We are um, proposing to prorate that. So anybody that comes in after January 1st, that fee would be cut in half. So that way it's basically $250 per six months in essence. Um, but the cutoff would be anything before between July 1 and December 31st would be a $500 fee. Anything from January 1st to June 30th would be $250. And then um, they would have to get an annual permit application submitted for us every year. And that's all that we have and we'll dive into the fee component, which is a separate agenda item with number nine in a few moments. But we think it's relevant to this proposal and, and worthy of discussion uh, with this proposal. We do have some information on property tax with agenda item number nine. So if you want to talk about that, I certainly can advance the slides, but. So the proration is only available for the second half of the year. You That's correct. You couldn't prorate the first half. You couldn't just say, the way like we try it or. The way we have it proposed right now would be you get basically six months. So you either five hundred dollars or it's two fifty, depending on when you make that application. I'm saying you couldn't come in July first and say I want six months. No, sir. Right. Okay. Okay. That would be a tracking problem for enforcement and permitting staff. Uh, we were talking about cleaning up and uh, waste removal and all that. Uh, how, how do they go about doing that? The food truck industry. So from what I understand right now, they, they take it with them and they have a commissary and they'll dump it there. If they have an arrangement with the business, then they certainly can put it in the dumpster. But we just want to make sure that they don't leave it outdoors and especially with being food items, we don't want animals basically having the trash thrown everywhere. So it needs to be properly disposed of. I have a question. Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I was going to ask, um, say, for example, if there happens to be an area um, in one of the industry or the commercial corridor that is very profitable with somebody, say, for example, if I had a food vendor in a particular spot and it's very profitable and you find out that that area is very profitable, how do you prevent a monopoly from occurring with the vendors? In other words, if somebody knows that a particular area is more profitable than others and the same individuals are in that particular area making money hand over fist, how do you make it more equitable that all of the vendors have an opportunity to be economically profitable in the city with their vending trucks? So our proposal does not factor that into the equation. If company A gets an agreement with, say, Standardine, mm -hmm. and it's good for this whole year, mm -hmm. and they sit up there every day, I mean, that's an arrangement between the food vendors and the business owner. So we don't currently have provisions to deal with that. If that's something that city council would like for us to do, we certainly could do that. I think it's a, it's a great point, but we're pretty much saying you have an annual permit, go at it in the city, get permission from the property owner, but we're not really regulating where you can't be there every day, all day. Okay. So, so the, we weren't getting into... Right. 
regulating that aspect sure. of it. However, but a business has the right to decline or accept That's a correct. food job. So, okay. okay. Um, uh, let's address, if I may, let me <laughs> also address that. Ryan is exactly correct. We, we do not have... Uh, nor do I think it would be appropriate mm -hmm. for us to determine whether food truck A versus food truck B should be at a location. That's why we are requiring it to be a notarized letter from the property owner. Now, the property owner, in my opinion, uh, is the one who has to regulate that. Uh, a pro and I want you to understand, I want the food truck folks who are outside to understand. If the property owner says, sure, you can use my property, but I'm going to charge you $100 a month, he has the right to do that. It's private property. It's no different than any other contractual relationship between two private parties. Mm -hmm. But the city government is not in any way setting up, nor do I think it's appropriate for us to set up to say, no, you can only be at this site 30 days. I believe that legally you could say that you can only be at a site 30 days. I will tell you, none of our research showed that. Mm -hmm. It is a point that we can further research if you'd like. Okay. But you are correct. There are going to be some very lucrative locations, and then there are going to be less lucrative locations. Because my next question was going to be then, um, how do we prevent that occurring? Say, for example, if I have a business and the property owner charges me $100. But you decide that you want to bring your vending truck and they're going to charge you $300. Um, how do we eliminate the disparity or the future disparity between one vendor versus other at the helms of the property owners? Well, I would say to you again, we have no jurisdiction there. Okay. That is a private contractual matter. And so, you know, once again, uh, it comes down, let's say for discussion purposes, that, uh, that you own a vacant lot. And I come to you and I say, I'd like to do such and such on your lot. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, uh, I'm going to charge you $100. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, I'm set up there and John comes by and he says, uh, Dr. Washington, how much is uh, Richard paying you for using your lot? Well, he's paying me $100. Well, how long did you rent that to him? Well, if there's no contract, it's a day-to-day -day out. You can say, well, $100. John can say, well, I'll give you 200 So then you notify me, uh, sorry, you got to move your truck. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the private sector contracting with each other. And I, I'd ask the attorney, do you think there's any role that the city has in regulating that? No, sir. Uh, all, other than saying a food truck can only be in a certain spot for X number of days, which I agree with you is not where you should be going or thinking about. It is uh, it, it's just like furniture stores. Mm -hmm. There are furniture stores in this town who make lots and lots of money. There are other furniture stores who probably have been striving and having a hard time keeping up during the pandemic. So it's, it's free enterprise, and that's just what it is. Okay. And the final question I had, um, for the sanitation grading, is there a sanitation grade certificate that the food vendors must post along with their permit so the public will know um, it's been um, graded by the Onslow Department of Public Health and they the same way that restaurants receive a sanitation grade, will the food vendor trucks be required? I do not know that for 100% certainty, so I, I, won't, I cannot give you that answer. I, based on them having to get county health department approval, uh -huh. I'm going to assume too. that they, they, they get one to. as well, and members from the food vendors probably can answer that mm -hmm. uh, affirmatively okay. one way or the other, but we want to make sure that they have the county health department approval. If that mm -hmm. requires that they have that grade shown and visible, Absolutely. then that's what we would expect them to do. That's what the health department would expect them to do. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just want to make sure I, that that uh, that I understand that if we have a special event, they're not required. The food the food vendors are not required to pay the city a five hundred dollar fee if they go through the special event and buy whatever, pay whatever fee that they might charge. We're not going to be charging them five hundred dollars for a one day deal, are we? That's correct. Okay. In fact, if you look on um, the attachment A. I think it's one of the very first things 
uh, under C5 on, um, sorry, I don't have the page number here, but basically uh, number two, it says there shall be a maximum of one food vendor per lot, except in accordance with the city sponsored or other special event. So just like you can only have one, mm -hmm. that would be an exception to that, but the same thing. If they're not operating just to the public, they're associated with that special event, as long as that special event, so let's say an automobile dealership decides they wanna have a customer appreciation day and they wanna use one of their 14 days and they wanna bring two or three food vendors in, that, that auto dealership is responsible for getting that special permit and bringing the food vendors on. If they are not a daily type food vendor, then they don't need to get that $500 uh, permit from us the automobile dealership does or whatever that business is what, what I wanted to make sure was that we did not hurt those uh, 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 charitable organizations for Correct. lack of a better word for using that at, for to help with their fundraising to help draw people Correct. in and I want to make sure that uh, they were not going to be penalized under this no we would not propose to kind of double permit something like that if that special event gets their permit that's the blanket coverage and that's the way that has been applied Mm -hmm. you know, to date anyhow, but that's, that's the intent. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one. All right, Mr. Jackson. Okay, Ryan, I know you said that only, uh, like if a vendor has to be a, I think you said a, a 250 feet away from a, a restaurant. 50 feet from a parcel that contains either a restaurant or another food vendor. Okay. A restaurant could, if they wanted to, could they bring in a food vendor if it was their choice on that restaurant? And I'm saying that because in, a, in Wilmington, I've seen that done. So we have two or three restaurant businesses that have food trucks, but they don't operate out of their food trucks. So it's not preventing them from having a mobile food vendor. For example, uh, Forkful, they have a food truck and they take it to special events and catering or whatever it may be. They wouldn't be able to operate at that location. Now, you bring up a good point. If we want to exempt the food truck business from operating at their location, let's say that they're doing a building renovation project I mean, that's something that we certainly could write into the ordinance. We haven't currently factored that into the ordinance. We could, we hadn't, we hadn't put that in though. So basically it's a spacing from that parcel. So we would say that that would not go because that's not meeting that 250 foot uh, spacing criteria. Well, what I'm saying is it's not based on what the vendor's food truck, but what I, for example, there's a brewery in uh, Wilmington and they, I can't think of the name of the organization, but they made the best uh, grilled cheese that you can ever taste. But they have brought in that that uh, that vendor to actually set up on their lot. That was an agreement. Um, I guess just to create some kind of synergy. I was just wondering if that possibility could exist. It could, it could, but the ordinance is not currently drafted that way, Dr. Woodruff. Yeah, let me um, let me give you some thought on that, if you don't mind. Let's say that uh, that the vendor is an, uh, that the restaurant is an Italian restaurant. On the other hand, they decide to bring in a food truck that's selling hot dogs and hamburgers. That's to me. That's uh, if you pardon the expression. That's kind of double dipping. Uh, I can understand that if you have an Italian food place and you want to have a food trailer out front that is also serving spaghetti to go since it's the same menu, but expanding your menu by having a food truck basically means you have two different type of restaurants on the same property. Uh, to me, that's, that's not really uh, the way that we're trying to, to allow food trucks to come in. Now, once again, as Ryan said, if the food truck is invited in for some special event, let's say that there's a grand opening, and since I'm on Italian food tonight for some unknown reason, let's say there's a new uh, Italian restaurant. If they're expecting so many people to come that they wanna have a food truck outside that's preparing the Italian food to go, fine. That would be under a special use permit. Because remember, restaurants can get a special use permit just like anybody else. 
But if you're going to bring in a different menu using that food truck, um, you know, we can certainly write it any way you want to, but right now the food truck has to be 250 feet away from the property line. But that's a policy question you all should address. And, and one of the reasons why we chose, currently the ordinance is 500. We cut that in half to 250. But the reason why we're proposing to do it from partial lines is that we're going to issue, the city's going to issue one permit application. You can go on to the city or the county GIS sites and you can say, I want to go at this location, buffer 250 feet around. And it will show you, if I go here, that there cannot be a food truck on any of these parcels or vice versa. So from a parcel, it makes it easy for not only city staff, if they call and say, hey, is it okay if I go here? Is that within 250 feet? Because we fully believe that's what's going to happen. But let's say that it's after hours, they can easily go onto that GIS site and select the site they want to go to, buffer the 250 feet, and it will very quickly show them where their competition would not be able to be located, or if they're the competition, where they can't locate if their competition is on that particular parcel. So it's easy to do in the GIS. You can do it on the phone even. I mean, it's on a tablet. It's very easy. And that's why we like using parcel lines with every dimensional setback that we use um, for permits such as this. It's just easy for us. It's easy for the applicants. I had a, I had a uh, thought along the same lines as uh, Councilman Jackson. Um, let's say we had a strip shopping center owned by one, uh, one owner. So therefore, it's a pretty, pretty wide property boundary. And at one end is a restaurant. A, a food vendor wants to go set up on the far end, for example, but on that person's property, we're telling them right now, you can't do that because it's on two restaurants on the same parcel. Aren't we interfering with a little bit of uh, personal private rights? The, would, wouldn't it be up to the, to the property owner to decide whether they want to allow a food vendor on their property, even though it might be competing against a brick and mortar restaurant. I mean, that would be between the, the owner and, and the restaurant owner and the, and the food vendors. Are we, are we interfering a little bit in this case uh, against private property? You bring up a, a, good, a good point. Um, well, I think there's several issues here. Number one, this strip shopping center has to have so much parking, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you know, you begin, certainly the government is about regulation, regulation to ensure that certain criteria is met, whether it's landscaping, whether it's parking, et cetera. When you let the property owner just decide he wants six food trucks there, whatever about the parking, forget that, then you have done away with your ability to regulate that. So you, you there's, you really, you've got a regulation issue here. I think that the government has an interest in. Do we do we address parking for 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 food vendors? Yes, we state in the ordinance that they cannot consume required parking spaces. So, for example, let's say a medical office, office park drive. Let's say that they're required 20 parking spaces, and they've provided 20. They have no extras. So Monday through Friday, let's say that that office is open eight to five. A food vendor cannot set up on that lot from 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. Now, after hours, if they have an arrangement with their property owner where I'm going to set up from 6 o'clock until 10 o'clock that evening, they can use those spaces because it's not competing with the business. But the ordinance is currently written to where if you don't have excess parking spaces, you cannot consume required spaces. I have a feeling that we, you know, if, if we pass this tonight, I, I think there may be some tweaks down the line, as, as we all know, when you when you try to pass something that uh, one size fits all, it doesn't. And somebody right. will legitimately bring us an exception that we all agree makes good common sense. And why did we? Why are we prohibiting it? So, it may be something that we may get into. We may address uh, Councilman Jackson's uh, uh, concern, or or a property owner may say, "I want to," you know, "I've got a strip shopping center." I happen to have a restaurant on it, but the rest of my businesses are, are uh, eight to five, and why can't I bring in a food vendor after five o'clock and use, utilize those unused parking spaces that are, that are no longer required by the businesses? So, 
you know, maybe we're trying, I'm trying to be a little too nitpicky. I'm just trying to think ahead, but I think we're going to, I think we're going to tweak it at some point if we pass. I think also to address Councilman Jackson and Ryan, you help me if I'm wrong. If Carolina Ale House, if, they've got parking all the way around it, et cetera. And that is a brewery in, in a lot of ways. It's a restaurant also. Okay. But if they wanted to have several food trucks, whatever several may mean, one or more, and they came down here and applied for a special use permit. Right. Special event Excuse permit? Excuse me, special event permit. If they wanted to come in one of those 14 days, they could yeah. utilize that. And they could then engage y'all in conversation about you, you can only have two or three of those because you've got to have so much parking, folks, right. I mean, and so forth. But again, you can get around the ordinance that Mr. Jackson, I think, wants to address, uh, not on an everyday basis, but certainly for a special event. That would be my point. And I think the important part is that we're talking about a restaurant. So let's say that you're a bar, tavern, nightclub. Let's say that you happen to have two fryers and you serve some finger foods. That's not a restaurant. That's a bar. So they would be able to set up at that location. We're talking about a food truck setting up on a parcel with a restaurant or within 250 feet of another restaurant or another food vendor. So I think some of those situations are a non-issue, but I think that in some cases there could be, and I think that John and Richard bring up a good point, there are some special event opportunities uh, for grand openings or if they want to have, you know, um, I know one establishment, they do something every year, you know, St. Patrick's Day. If they wanted to bring in some specialty, you know, they can pull a special event for that. So, Ryan, you say they can't have can't be within 250 feet of another food vendor. Correct. Well, how do you establish precedence? I mean, who's who's there first? You know, it's, I mean, it's. I mean, what's what's the rationale there? We just don't want a, a string or a line of. I mean, food there. You want them on every parcel? I mean. Well, I don't. I mean, I guess you could. Feeling, but, but I just I don't understand how the how the vendor. You know the food, but I mean I, I'm not going to object to it. It just seems kind of yeah. When when, when Dr. Yeah. Washington raised the question about you know staying every day of the month, it actually went through my head as well. Another issue that could present themselves is, well, I got there at seven o'clock, you didn't get there till eight next door, so I'm here first, mm -hmm. and how that's going to be regulated. I mean, at the end of the day, we've talked to the food vendors. We've said these are going to be the rules. They help draft them. We're expecting them to abide by those rules and work it out amongst one another. From what I understand, there's a lot of them that have good camaraderie with one another. So hopefully, you know, uh, they can handle that issue and it be a non-issue. If it isn't, like you all have, like council has stated, I think we're probably going to be looking at this in some form or fashion with tweaking it if council does adopt it tonight. Wasn't it um, originally when we were talking about distance or looking at distance in other jurisdictions, I see this too, the distance thing was away from front doors of restaurants. Yes. And the reason why we are not dealing it from the door is because, you know, the easiest thing in the GIS is simply to identify a parcel line. You know, uh, it, it just, you know, you, you can measure it any way you want to. That's right. But we thought the simplest thing is just simply use the legal boundary of the property. And I mean, we're also cutting that in half from 500 to 250. So, I mean, we're back in that standard as well. But I'm saying one food truck can't be within 250 feet of another one. Right. Correct. Let me address a couple of things relative to enforcement. Uh, remind everybody, including the food vendors that are out there, don't call the police department if somebody gets there before you do. Uh, this is not a criminal event. This is code enforcement. Our code enforcement people work eight to five. We don't plan on being out there at 8 o'clock at night. If somebody's in your slot and they don't have permission, then the next day you call. But this is not a police matter. You don't dial 911 because somebody's food truck is in your slot. The other part that I want to be very upfront with, and that's the point that uh, Mr. Warden has brought up, it has historically been the approach that city council has taken to constantly monitor and adjust the UDO. I can't remember exactly how many times, but I would guess that since 2014, including tonight, we have tweaked, adjusted, amended, whatever right adjective it is, our unified development zoning ordinance 
pick a number, 20 times or more. I will also remind people of this. Currently, we do not allow the food trucks, only at special events. And as Ryan and I have met with the food vendors, we've been very upfront. Folks, we don't like problems. If city council is going to give you this opportunity, you need to be serious about following the rules because what government giveth, government can taketh. So play within these rules, they understand that. But I will be the first to tell you, right now our code enforcement people are still battling the results of Hurricane Florence two years ago. I have no intentions of coming to you and saying because of this, this, and this with food trucks, I've got to add three staff people. You're not going to like that, and I'm not going to like that. So I know the food vendors are out in the audience or out in the atrium listening. I want it made very clear. Follow the rules. Don't make this a problem. Understand this is possibly a gift to you by the council. Because if we constantly have problems, I guarantee you as your manager, I will be back in front of you asking you to repeal what you are proposing to give tonight. And as Dr. Woodard said, we certainly can do that. Now, what I would envision happening is, let's say that it doesn't work out and we're back before city council next September. Then the permits that we issue in on between July and September would be valid for that one year. And after that, we just would not do a renewal. So, and we've been upfront with the food vendors about that. I think the bigger concern would be, let's say that I run out and buy a food vendor, a mobile cart, because council adopts this standard. If they don't hear this, that what the government giveth can taketh away, you know, they could be, well, man, I just bought a $50,000 food truck and mm -hmm. I can only use it for two more months in Jacksonville. So I agree with what Dr. Woodard was stating. You know, we've, we've stressed that to them that, you know, you help propose the regulations. We need you all to kind of abide by that if it gets adopted. That way it's a smooth process for everybody involved. I think that's a fair, fair trade off. And, and I can tell you, I mean, the, this draft was sent to the applicant on two different occasions and based on the feedback that he provided to me that he also got from his counterparts. We believe other than the one notary statement, which they may or may not object to that, that's the only thing that I'm aware of that we weren't on the same page when I last communicated with them prior to going to planning board. So um, hopefully what is being drafted, they're on board with. And I believe that at least the applicant is. Now, there may be some other food vendors that didn't participate in the application process that they may want to, you know, um, make some adjustments to it. But the person that made the application, we communicated with directly and several others. But, um, you know, we, we believe this is something that, that at least the applicant supports based on our conversations with them. Okay. Council, we're going to have a public hearing on this matter, and um, we're going to begin. Uh, I'm going to begin by reading you the rules as far as public hearings are concerned. I know there are several people who want to speak, so I want to make sure that we understand the rules around it. You're asked to come to the lectern and to clearly state your name and address so that the clerk can properly enter it into the record. Each speaker will be allowed only one opportunity to speak. So please organize your thoughts before coming to the podium. We have allotted a maximum time of three minutes, no more than three minutes. And we request that groups designate a spokesperson to address the group's concern. Uh, and in the interest of time, we ask that if another speaker has already raised a point or addressed your concern, that it not be repeated. So with that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you for your time. Um, a few things that I saw that I'd like to address. We have need to have you, a, need you to state your name and address. Sorry, my name is Joseph Broda. Okay. Live at 700 Royce Ave, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Um, to address what you were going on about the food health rating, we have to have that in every single one of the food trucks. It's posted in visual sight. We are a restaurant. 
Um, as far as the restaurants, one per parcel, I'd like to know why my restaurant is still being discriminated against other restaurants. Brick and mortars can be set up. You could have multiple, one, two, three, next to each other. No 250 feet, no 50 feet, sometimes not even 10. Um, $500 is still a little egregious, in my opinion, for a fee. I would like to know what is that fee even covering just for me to be allowed to serve, which I should already be allowed to serve. You have cities like Wilmington where I call. Hey, I'm coming down. My name is Joe. I'm with Joey's Pizza. I got a health rating. Send me your stuff. Where are you going? Uh, just like the gentleman on the screen was trying to talk about symbiotic relationships, going down to Wilmington to a bar, being allowed to sit up there, even though it's next to a restaurant, it's because they don't have the 250 foot rule. Uh, again, we're a restaurant. I meet every criteria that a restaurant does. I pay all the taxes as we already discussed before. So again, I don't know why my restaurant has to have a permit while other restaurants don't, brick and mortar ones. And it doesn't matter if it's a brick and mortar or a mobile, because even brick and mortars, they're mobile too sometimes, right? They deliver, they do other things. Um, I think, I'd like to thank you guys for all the work that you've been doing, but I still see a lot, a lot wrong with some of these amendments that are still not fair to my business that are inhibiting to other businesses. I don't see why we would protect one and not the other. I think it's unconstitutional to do so. Um, and as far as the gift goes, I usually receive a gift. I don't pay for a gift. The extortionists usually take my money. Um, so th that's all I really have to say, but there's some other people that would like to say some things too. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Greg Waters. I'm from GNC Catering. Um, the the as Joseph was stating, the the distance thing is. Uh, um, also, if we're not required, uh, they want us to require to have a trash can. We're takeout. We're, we're not having people sit down and eat right there, so they have no reason to throw trash right there. That's just an odd piece of equipment that we got to carry around our food, a trash can. Uh, then you have, uh, I understand what you were saying about business to parking space and whatnot, but if we're to operate during business hours, if we're restricted because of parking spaces, that restricts us from doing our job because we have no place to set up. Most of these places that we're trying to set up have parking lots. So they're allocated X amount of parking spaces per, you know, building. So if we take up three or four spots, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but according to you, that is a problem. So it shouldn't be a problem because it, it, if I got a thousand people that work at the hospital nine to five and they're closed the rest of the evening, what's the purpose of me setting up in their parking lot after hours? Ain't nobody there. So, you know, that defeats that purpose. You know, I know things will get tweaked and whatnot, but, you know, some things you have to look at at a reality, you know, base and you know, the $500 is quite a lot, is no guarantee, but then with $500, you're restricting us. That's a lot of money, you know, and you have to weigh the options because we can't have signage, you're saying. A lot of us have the flag swoops, which go higher than your unit. So you're saying we can't display that. So people, if they don't know you there, most people notice you from your swoops your signage because that's how they know you you know and if you don't have advertisement they might not even know you there mm -hmm. and some people you know everybody's not linked to social media so some people ride past because they know you there but they're looking for your flag they don't see your flag they keep it moving 
You know, that's as simple as it is. It ain't as, it ain't as gravy as you think it is. Because, you know, we're not... Golden Corral has been there for years, so everybody knows it's right there. When you're trying to start up something, it's it takes time to build it up. Thank you. Thank you. It's two, excuse me. There's two teams in the league. Don't be offended. That's the Raiders and anybody play Dallas. So I won't hold it against you. <laughs> All right. Name Thank you. Serial number, please. Uh, my name is Ashley Thompson. I'm a native of Jacksonville. I'm a new guy. Need your address. Uh, 509 North Brookside Court, Jacksonville, North Carolina, 28540. Thank you. Uh, I'm a new guy on the block. I just moved here from Benson, North Carolina, <laughs> uh, chasing a girlfriend of five years. And uh, she works here locally at the Naval Hospital. Uh, we had been doing back and forth with each other and uh, decided it was time we got closer. And uh, she's a native here at Jacksonville, born and raised. I decided to make the move down here and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be in front of you guys. I'm glad that you're considering uh, being a little bit more lenient towards what we do. I was in the uh, car business for 16 years of my life, a, a long, long portion of my career. And uh, when I moved, I had a passion. I've always wanted to own a restaurant. I've always wanted to uh, cook. I have a, a talent that I want to showcase. And uh, thankfully, uh, through a prosperous career, I was able to save up a little bit of money and uh, try to pursue that dream of mine. And uh, here I am in Jacksonville, North Carolina, pursuing my new company, Legacy Barbecue. Um, we are a, a very clean operation. I've heard some concerns on uh, sanitation. We are judged just like a restaurant. Uh, the only difference between us and a restaurant is that in fact that if I don't like where I'm at, I can move. Um, we use commercial grade equipment, just like a restaurant would use. And I think that you'll find during this previous year, especially that these food trucks offer a great service. They offer a service for people to be able to get meals for themselves and families in a proper manner with very little contact. Um, you could pull up to my food truck and never even get out of your car. So the fact that we, we offer in these great times, uh, just disturbing times, and we're trying to figure out what we're doing with COVID. We offer a great service, and I think you should consider that in your thoughts. Um, you know, our kitchens are much smaller than most restaurants. In turn, we can keep them cleaner. Uh, we can sanitize more, we can clean more. We are mobile, so we can take that truck and, and do a lot more things that, that some commercial kitchens can't even do. So, uh, you know, I, I've never heard that brought up in your discussions. I'd like to bring that to light. Please consider that in, um, in your thoughts. And again, thank you guys for considering to be a little bit more lenient on what we do as we pursue our passions. Because one day I want to own a restaurant. And uh, I want to work to get there. I want to do it the right way. So thank you guys again for your time. Thank yep. you so much. And welcome to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor and Council, there's probably 20, 25 people in A and B and uh, another three or four out here. And I've been to both places and no one else wants to speak during this time, because they've all been not given the opportunity. Okay. All right, so appreciate those that did come and speak. And uh, you're also being asked to consider the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment as it was presented tonight. 
Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, unified, U, U, unified Development Ordinance Amendment as, as written. I do have some concerns about a few things, but I think at this point, I, I think we need to um, experiment and allow it and uh, just see see what tweaks we'll need to do down the road. So I make a motion in, in support of it. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council, any discussion? I, I did want to say one thing. I've kind of come to light here that, you know, we talked about the $500 and the fees and stuff, but you know, they've got a lot, a little more of a hurdle than just $500. I mean, they need to get an established relationship with a property owner. Yeah. You don't want to go stepping out there and say, well, now I can do it, but where am I going to go? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. I feel like we could have done it with more leniency, but at least if we can get it started and some people can find some success, but it, it's still going to be quite a challenge for these folks to, to make it worthwhile. I mean, it's like, like a, this, you know, the, the restrictions on the, the locations. I mean, you know, sometimes it's better to have, I mean, as a business to be centrally located, you look at the, the strip of the car lots now they're all they like to be they're together. all near each other like and i think together. restaurants are the same way that's um, true but i do want to you know just say that uh i'm glad we're doing something i hope we can keep an eye on it and if it's not going to be detrimental to the city that we could look at you know loosening up on it as time goes by the thing about the udo as mentioned before you know when it was built when we had the whole idea of the udo we knew that we were going to be making changes periodically to fit our needs, you know, at the, the needs of our citizens. So appreciate the comments. I want to add to this. Like Randy said, they're, you know, they do have a hurdle to overcome because um, they're not only trying to find a, a lot to put it on, they also have to find the foot traffic to come through there and come to them. Um, as I mentioned before, I was talking more of a synergistic relationship um, that in Wilmington they've made it work. And I was wondering, I think Ryan said something about some of the things they've done in Swansboro. And I'm wondering if we looked at other cities comparable to our size or even looked at the way Wilmington was doing, how they've been successful down there with it to try to get an idea. I, I also, um, I'm a vote in favor of it. I think this is a great opportunity for persons that want to become uh, um, business owners. And I, ha I have several food deserts in the, in the area where I live in. So um, I'm looking forward to at least having some other options. The, the, the fee, $500, is that standard? That, that'll be other, discussed. Other municipalities? We've got that set up on That's agenda item nine agenda to kind of nine. dive into detail. I'm sorry? We were going to talk about that with agenda item nine. Okay. I'll answer your question, uh, Mr. Bittner. I'll be happy to answer your question. What you'll find is there is no standard. Uh, you can find that some people charge $50, some people charge $300, some people charge $400, some people charge $600. It's, it's almost any, anything that you want to select. Whatever you think is reasonable. Well, I really appreciate the comments that were in favor of this ordinance proposal when we talked about overlay zones and i can see the council wasn't inclined to go that direction uh, i guess it's a matter of changing times i'm going to uh, support the ordinance even though i have some reservations but like bob says i think maybe after six months a year we'll find out things that need amended and make it a little better for everyone concerned. So that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. Anyone else? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. And all those in favor of this or, uh, text amendment uh, indicate so by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Mayor. Yes, is it, sir. Is it possible for me to kind of address one or two items that were mentioned in the public comment session? I know that you've already adopted the code, but one of the things that staff looked at was we didn't want to allow 
a mobile food vendor to do something that, that our other businesses could not. So we're talking about feather flags. A, in a strip center, if you have a 40 foot wide unit, you get one flag, that's it. You don't get 15 on the top of the roof. So likewise with the strings of lighting, um, the parking requirements, if you're, if you, when you're Sam's Club and you wanna have your um, seasonal displays, they cannot take up required parking spaces. So they come to us and they say, hey, we've got 20 extra spaces. We're gonna use this for our seasonal display. So we're not doing anything different. And that's a conversation that we had, uh, that I had with, with the applicant is, we're not trying to treat them really any differently than we are uh, our, our, other rest, our, our other restaurants and businesses. Just like spacing, one of the things was mentioned about spacing. Um, bad example, but I'm gonna use it. There's only five locations, five overlays that an adult business can locate it. And then they have to be separated from another adult business. They have to be separated from a church. They have to be separated from schools, daycares, things of that nature. So we do have other spacing within our ordinance. So this isn't something that's just unique to the food industries, the food truck industry. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Thank you. I, I do have one thing. I, like I said, I agree with the vote, but I also wanted to know how we measured up our, you know, did we, what other cities other than Swansboro that we looked at, you know, because I'm fig I figured we did look at a few to try to find out where we, we needed to be. And I, I would just like to know some more information on that. Yes, we, we will be happy to provide that. We have information from Wilmington, Fayetteville, Raleigh, Greenville, Swansboro. And I think those are the primary areas that we looked at. Uh, Fayetteville and Raleigh are very similar in terms of their ordinances. In fact, one may have borrowed the others. Sometimes as planners, we, we utilize what other people um, you know, have put together before us. So uh, one of the places that Jacksonville turns to right off the bat is we look at Rock Hill, South Carolina, Currituck County, and Fayetteville. And the reason why we do that is similar in size. Uh, Fayetteville is obviously a military installation is located there, but it was actually, the ordinance was also drafted by the same consulting firm that drafted Jacksonville's Unified Development Ordinance. So the structure is the same. So we're able to very easily go, well, we know we need to look at Article 5, which is the development standard. So we can very easily find that information. So that's kind of why we, we look at those locations. But I'll be happy to send that information to council so that you can see what those ordinances are. All right, thank you. So we're going to go now to item number eight. And as soon as I get back to it. Oh, Jeremy's going to do it. Okay. This is the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment for the uh, Article 4.2 Use Specific Standards. And Jeremy Smith will be uh, presenting this item. Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, agenda Item 8 is a, another proposed amendment to the UDO. Some of the council may recall uh, in May 2019. I believe it was that city council adopted new standards for contractors offices uh, located in to be allowed in the corridor commercial zoning district with that adoption came new standards for contractors office which included landscaping of their storage areas, outdoor areas. The idea is along the, our corridors, the city council wanted to protect, protect them visually, aesthetically. And so we introduced on top of our standard landscaping requirements, your buffer yards, your perimeter buffering, your street lawn was additional landscaping and fencing around storage yards. We've now been using that just a little shy of two years. And the issue we've seen is while the intent was to protect our corridors, it's also a penalty for contractor offices that are locating in the industrial district where we want contractor offices, where you want that storage. And so what we've seen is it's a significant increase to contractors offices that are located in industrial zones when they have to basically double up their landscaping and it's not serving our intent of protecting a corridor. So in reviewing the ordinance, 
we're looking to amend Article 4.2 um, under industrial uses for build, building, heating, plumbing, electrical contractors with outside storage to basically eliminate the landscaping requirement around the storage area when a contractor's office is located in the industri industrial district. The planning board reviewed this last week at their January meeting, and they with staff are recommending approval of this amendment that the amendment is consistent with the adapted, adopted Camel land use plan, policy 38.2, that the revision of development regulations to be responsive to innovative development proposals and existing conditions, and in this case, um, the location of contractor's office in the intended industrial zones, and that the amendment is reasonable and is in the public interest and that we are recommending the amendment found in attachment A. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a lot to take in, but it's a, it's a fairly straightforward amendment, and we believe that it will protect or still protect our corridors when you have a contractor's office in the commercial corridor, but alle alleviate this extra landscaping in the industrial zones. Mm -hmm. Council, any questions of Jeremy? Yes, Ryan. Thank you, Jeremy. One of the, um, as council mentioned tonight, is you know kind of revisiting and looking at our ordinance. As Jeremy stated, we just adopted this in May of 2019, and we're already bringing back an amendment to you. And basically, what we discovered, as Jeremy mentioned, was penalizing those in the, in the industrial zone. We actually did a site comparison. Mm -hmm. A site comparison of a three-acre site had more landscaping that was required with our current standards that we're asking council to change. Yeah. For as the reason, 11 acre story, Publix and Michaels and Ulta location. So the same amount of landscaping that that large commercial development, 11 acres had with a three acre site. So we felt that the, there was quite a disparity and that really wasn't the intent when we brought this amendment to council back in May. And that's why we're again before you tonight. So like you had mentioned, like the council mentioned previously, we'll, We've made amendments in November. We're making amendments in January. And as we see things, um, unfortunately, we've got to go through the, the, the public hearing process and the planning boards to council. So it's about a 90-day minimum process at best, at best. And, um, you know, we'll be bringing changes as we realize that, hey, there's, that's not really what the intention was. So just wanted to point that out, that the disparity between an 11-acre commercial site versus a three-acre industrial site, which is where you want uh, a contractor office to locate. Thank you. Any other questions for the council? All right. There's a required public hearing in this matter. At this time, I'll we'll recess the council meeting and open up the public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this matter? All right. No one wants to speak, so I will close the public hearing. Council, you're being asked to consider the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the uh, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment as presented tonight. I have a second. second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Agenda item number nine is fee schedule amendment for food vendors. And uh, Brian will be presenting this item. Thank you, Mayor. Council, um, with the adoption of the Unified Development Ordinance Amendment, we need to establish a uh, fee for the food vendors. And we have proposed that uh, tonight uh, just to kind of go over uh, the, the food truck revenue sources. And, and they're even applicable to other bricks and mortar, whether it be restaurants or office, doesn't matter. Um, every Every location has to make an application. So uh, food vendor, restaurant, they have to apply for a certificate of occupancy and a building permit, which is typical. Now, it's not necessarily annual, but they do make that application. So there is an application fee to do business. Anybody that sells something within the city of Jackson, North Carolina, basically the city gets a portion of that sales tax revenue back. Personal property tax, that is things such as kitchen equipment. 
So if you're located in the city, then we get a portion mm -hmm. of that equipment tax, which is the personal property tax. Same thing with a motor vehicle tax because you've got food vendors, but you also have restaurants that have vehicles. That property tax, if it's within Jacksonville, the city gets a portion of those fees. So as you can see, that those are all kind of the same. The biggest issue is property tax. Your bricks and mortar pay them. Your mobile food vendors are not. Uh, unless they have a commissary and they pay part of their, uh, their rent uh, in the city of, city of Jacksonville. So we wanted to kind of show council tonight that we were proposing, and then we'll give you a little bit of background information. Um, they requested $200. We are establishing a fee recommended at $500. It'd be good for one year. So every July 1st, they'll have to obtain a new permit. Uh, the 50% proration after January 1 would knock it down to $250. And this was just simply a just random uh, review of property taxes that are paid by food establishments. And as you can see, they range primarily from $1,353 annually to as much as $12,000 on Western Boulevard in a brand new building. So quite a bit more than $500 that they're paying in property tax revenue. Now, I mentioned specifically one moment ago about the commissary. We do have a commissary location. It's 851 Dennis Road. Uh, Mr. Broda's, uh, I think that's his commissary. That one unit, what I did was I took the six units, took the property tax that that establishment pays, divided it by six, and that equates to $643. But there's no, there's no requirement that you have a commissary in the city of Jacksonville. So in Mr. Broda's situation, he's paying a portion of that $643 because he's one of the multi-tenants that uses that for commissary. So I also looked at, well, let's look at another um, tenant space. And I used Lazar's Pizza because that is a tenant space. Lazar's Pizza pays $1,500 annually. Once again, that was the full, it's a four unit strip, strip center. I took that total amount, divided it by four, and uh, so subways would be the same thing, the subways that's located in that center. Um, the little subway that is located on uh, the 180 block of Western Boulevard, closest to Highway 24, set back off the road, you can't hardly see it. Uh, their, their property tax is $3,175 annually. So we, we felt that $500 was fair in comparison to what um, our other bricks and mortar restaurant pay in terms of property taxes annually. So that's kind of where staff, you know, arrived at that number. As Dr. Woodruff stated uh, with, Dr., uh, with um, Councilman Bittner's question earlier, the fees range um, across the, you know, whether it be $100 or $500, it kind of all over the board in terms of, it wasn't kind of a common that we saw, but you know, everybody's at 350. So we looked at the tax revenue and based on that, we're recommending to city council at the $500 annual permit fee. Ryan, to clarify your testimony, are the figures on the board the taxes paid to the city of Jacksonville or are they a combination of taxes paid to the city and the county? That's a great question. This is just the city portion. So it's actually this probably almost times two. But this is the city's portion. That's, thank you for asking that question. That's good. Any questions of Ryan on this? All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Mr. Ward. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I, I think the $500 is appropriate, but I would like to see us charge non-city food trucks more, perhaps double. My, my, and my thought process on that is if, if I'm a city resident, um, if I live here, if my, of course, my, my home is, is paying the tax, but, but my business portion is also paying a tax. If I have a food truck, then it's taxed as personal property. If I have a trailer, it's being taxed as personal property. And then my truck that pulls the trailer is also, <coughs> so I see those folks as contributing to the wear and tear of uh, our roads. 
I see them contributing their, uh, the city residents uh, paying their fair share of, of the fire, the police, the uh, protection that they get. Um, and yet I see the, a non-city resident pays $500, but they still, they would still get the same fire and police protection. They would still provide this uh, wear and tear on the, on the city roads, and yet we're not, in my mind, not being adequately compensated from, from what, they're, what they're doing. So I, I, I would like to see a non-city resident food vendor be charged double. I, I think a thousand dollars, in my mind, would be would be certainly fair and reasonable. Um, the the folks out on the base are paying ten percent off the top, gross. Um, you know, it's not unusual for somebody out there to be paying three to five thousand or more a month for for permits out there, and and. You know, of course, they've got a perhaps better location. It's going to generate, they have to generate more, more money to offset that. But I, I just think that the city mobile uh, restaurant folks need some protection also. So my argument is that we uh, inc look at increasing what we charge a non-city food vendor more so than, than a city food vendor. Uh, well, what, I, I, what makes the distinction between a city food vendor and a non-city place of residence? Place of residence. Yeah, I, I tend to agree somewhat with what he's saying. That obviously, if somebody lives here, they're already contributing. I don't agree with the five hundred dollars. I think that it's you know we talked about this local. I mean, I understand the local restaurants' contribution or their property tax, but they're they're. 24-7, 365. I mean, these people that are trying to make some revenue on an intermittent basis, they're not there every day. There's like, I, I can't imagine there's going to be somebody that's going to be somewhere all day, every day for a, a year. I mean, I would be willing to, if we wanted to do a double, then say, uh, you know, 250 for the regular people. For the in-town people and, and maybe 500 for the out-of-town if you want to try to do some compensation there but you know the basics of business and economics is if you want more of something Thanks. you make it more expensive if you want no if you want more of something you make it less expensive if you want less of something you make it more expensive i think that we're going to I mean, we're trying to help them, but I'm thinking we're going to miss the mark and not really give them the opportunity to to survive or, 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 or thrive, even, even survive. I think the 500, as the person mentioned, we don't have any gauge. They don't have any gauge. I mean, I think almost anybody would be happy to pay 10% of sales for their rent. I mean, that's, that's, in this day and age, with the, the way rents are, that's, that's, a good, that's a good number. And they're also given a variable. You talk about the base. If they don't do anything, they don't pay anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's different out there. There's a whole different world. I mean, they've got the concentration of population and consumers that, that we're not going to find here. So I was actually in favor of a lower annual fee. But... The, I think if you start, especially $1,000, I don't believe anybody would do it. I mean, who, who's got the, again, you've got everything else behind that that's going to. We have, we, the city, the city bears the cost of those. So you're suggesting that we spread it, that we spread the cost of what they're costing us among all the, all the citizens. I'd rather see the users pay their fair share. And in my mind, uh, I would rather charge the user, the, in this case, the food vendor, more than I would trying to spread it throughout to let the people, you know, the, the general population pay that portion of it. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to send fire people out there to do inspections. Yeah, if, if you're a bricks and mortar, you're paying more. It's, it's really, but I don't know that we can send a fire 
a couple firemen out there doing inspection for two hundred dollars. Mm. I don't. I, I think. I think it costs us more than two hundred dollars to to send a fire fire people out there to do an inspection. Is that the way the process is going to work? Every time somebody sets up, they're going to have a, or they would have to come to us and get approved. From what I understand, they'll have to have that done annually, just like with the health department. So they'll have to go by and get the fire department to sign off on their truck, and yeah, whether that's right, good for one year or three years, whatever the time period is. But that's right. the way I understand it. Dr. But they pay how much a year for that? How much is that a year? I'm not sure if they charge a fee, and if so, what it is. We can look at that. We can look at that. I know that they that there is a fee for fire inspections in the ETJ. There is not a fee for businesses in the city unless we have to go back. I doubt we could roll a truck for two hundred dollars. Well, they don't. You were saying they're going to have to come to them anyway. They're not going to. They're not going to be on call. They're going to have to bring it their facility to the fire department. Correct. I mean, we certainly can establish procedures, but I believe that's the the plan because I mean they're going to be mobile. So, um, I mean, we have talked with fire some, but we didn't ask that specific question in terms of do you have to bring it to the fire department for approval? Well, they could set that as their policy. Right? They could, and maybe that's the, if that's the direction you want to have done, then we'll just say that you've got to bring it by the Center for Public Safety with an appointment. What we could do is very similar to taxi permits. We require you to bring your taxi to the Center for Public Safety for the police department to inspect. So that's a good point, to be quite honest with you. It's not something we've even thought about on inspecting these vehicles. But yes, what we could do is say, to get your fire inspection, you must bring that vehicle to the fire department, and we can establish that. We should have that before you even sell them a permit. You should make them comply with that, because what, what good would the permit do if they were... We, to pay you five hundred dollars, and then the fire department say, "Well, you're, you can't do it anyway." That's so. very easy for us to establish tomorrow morning. Well, that's what we do so. with a regular business, right? Mm -hmm. well, like a restaurant. Yeah. I mean, already had that be part of the permitting process. Yeah. Right. They would have to have that fire inspection done. And as as Mr. Carter just stated, I mean, when they go to these special events, they have to. I, I think that's when a lot of the inspections done is that they go by and they look at everybody that's set up at this special event. From what I understand, now that we're going to allow this. The question is, does that inspection at that special event, does it run for a year? Does it run for three years? If it doesn't and they they have to have it inspected, then we're just going to say they need to bring it by the Center for Public Safety for an inspection. I want to uh, ask Ryan a question. Ryan, did you find in any of the municipalities that you looked at is there was an in-city and out-of-city fee, or was it just a fee for anyone doing business in the city? I don't remember seeing kind of a, a differential right. on a fee like that. First of all, we, I think it, 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 I think we're charting in new waters. We certainly have in-city and out-of-city fees for our recreation department. Yes. We already have that. So let's presume that we can do that. You need a definition of what an in-city person or resident is. Uh, I can envision that if you're going to charge me $1,000 and I live in Swansboro to come into Jacksonville, I can probably rent a room or I can, you know, get a hundred dollar a month. I mean, I can find a way to at least argue the point with you. I think you're going to have a challenge there if you have too much of a disparity. It may be an enforcement challenge. Um, then y'all can decide what is appropriate. But, but again, it's, we are uh, paddling in, in, in new waters, I believe, if you go down that road. Has anybody and got I, any idea what the gross receipts is for one of these food trucks on average? I talked to the state, and they, they don't really provide a whole lot of that information other than we get our percentage back. But that's um, to kind of to, to add on to what Mr. Carter stated. You know, one of the things that went through my mind when you were having the discussion was, well, if you got a home occupation, then you have a residence. Um, so we could check that box that, yes, you live in the city. Um, another option may be, well, if you have a commissary, so you're paying rent. At this location, we would want to see some sort of a valid lease arrangement that shows that they're either the um, they have a lease or a sublet, uh, so that they're paying a portion. So I think if you decide to go in that direction, we would want to see whether you know either a, an approved home occupation and you're in the city limits, or you have an approved commissary with a lease in the city. If if you're interested in going that direction, I think there's ways to where we can kind of look at that. It's just 
I would want some direction on, well, if you have a home occupation, but your commissary is not in the city, is that adequate or vice versa? So we would just want to get that clarification so that we can make that as part of our application um, process when they apply. Because I have, I have a, a good idea that we'll have a lot of people asking about our application come tomorrow morning. So um, thankfully, we've got another day to, uh, to kind of get that finalized because we have started on that process. Mayor, two, two comments regarding that. I would not tie it to residency. I would tie it to whether you are a, whether you can document that you're paying property tax to the city. And let me give you an example. If a person, and I know one of the gentlemen who, who spoke this evening uh, is a resident of the city. So he owns property, he pays property tax. I know that one other gentleman who spoke this evening is not a resident of the city. But he may, I don't know, he may pay property tax because he may own a commercial building. I would, if you're, if you're going to look at that, I would tie it to documented payment of property tax, not residency. And let me just finish the point this way. If one of these gentlemen owns a commercial building and he leases that building out, then he's a property tax payer to the city, regardless of whether he's a resident of the city. So that would be the thought is if you're going to have uh, a, a two, if you're going to have a, a double fee, then it should be tied to proving that you pay property tax, not residency. That's, that's agreeable. Right. Except for the rental. Well, it's a but. <laughs> but if you lease my property, you're not paying property tax, you're paying me. And I'll take that money and pay the property tax. So you, as the uh, food truck operator, can't document that in that situation. And that's probably what you got on this property. You said it was on Cardinal or whatever. Dennis, 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 Dennis Road, Road, yeah. So I'm not sure that's going to be a sure thing. You know, your, your idea of, uh, of, of a property, documented property owner, doesn't really, in this case, I think, apply. We're talking about the mobile restaurant. We're talking about it, it's either a, a truck or a trailer. If it's parked outside and it, it's residence, it's, it's actual residence is, is non-city. I don't really care that he owns a, another piece of property yeah. because it's not, it, it's not applicable to what, what we're talking about in this case. Okay. You know, we're, we're providing fire and police for his, for his other property, but we're not talking about providing it for his uh, mobile restaurant. And so I don't see that that really makes, I, all I'm trying to do is make sure that we are, as Ryan has stated here, that we are trying to treat all of our uh, restaurants the same. And I think if we charge a non-city restaurant the same that we charge in the city, we're not being, we're not being fair. We're not being just. We're not being equal. Because because we're providing, we're providing, we're providing yeah. services to, to one that they're not, the one isn't paying nearly what the other person is paying. And I don't think that's, that's just or fair or equitable. So. I agree with the concept. I was just trying to figure out how we define yeah. how yeah. you pay it. I think that's the problem is the definition. I thought about the, uh, you know, is it, is it, is it, uh, are we legally allowed to charge? And I, the recreation is the only thing that I came up with that I knew we charge a non, non city residents. Well, you know, city, how do you establish that? Out of city sewer service, <laughs> right? Yeah. And how do you determine, really, how do we determine what the fee is? We, we basically, we feel like whatever the market can bear, whatever's, you know, we try not to, to hurt somebody, but we certainly know, recognize that, that we need to make sure that we treat the city resident who's paying paying for these services gets a break versus a non, and I don't see the difference here. As to Randy's point, um, hey, I'm, I'm not necessarily stuck on $500. That was just, I'm just commenting based on what staff was proposing, but I, I'm, I'm a, I, I feel like $200 is probably a little too cheap. You know, I don't know where, where, where I'd be happy, but, uh, or 250. I, I'm not sure that that uh, 
you know, well, there, there's well, a how about three hundred for a resident. Well, there, there's a cost. There's a cost to doing business. Yeah. I, I know we're we're talking about regulating, but we're talking about staff is going to have to spend time, taking time to to do up an application. We're talking about the fire department is going to have to take time to to do inspection. We get a complaint. Who's going to roll? Well, code enforcement is going to go look at it. There's another cost. I, I just don't want to. I don't want to make it so cheap that it, that we that it cost us for for them to to do business here. That it cost us. It, and it doesn't just cost us. It, we're talking about spreading it among all the taxpayers rather than the ones that are actually causing the issue. Well, six hundred. I'd make, a, I'd make a motion that the fee for the license be $500, except for residents upon proof of residence, $300. So how do, how do we prove the residents? I mean, that's a great question. They would need to get a home occupation permit. That's another $50. Too. So we would have it documented that they get a home occupation permit. Now that's a one-time fee, so that's not annual. That's a one-time, so we would not issue the second part without the first part, and then that's how we would we would guarantee it. But we're going to have to do that annually when the when the food truck permit comes in. We're going to have to make sure that they still reside at that location for them to get the resident break. But if they're running a business out of their home, they need a home occupation permit can, as well. Can can we not can we not check to where they're paying their their personal property tax for for the food truck or the the trailer, whatever that mobile is? Is there any way of checking that way? I think that you have that ability um, through the self service uh, through the tax office. I think that that's something that staff could do very easily. And if not, uh, Harry Smith and that, his staff have been that would more be than if you could verify that. That to me would be easier than trying to worry. about us trying to determine where residency is let mm -hmm. wherever they registered that that mobile food truck and they're paying the personal property tax also county should have that record i don't have a problem i don't have a problem if we want to charge a, a percentage uh, randy thought that was a great idea let's charge them a percentage of what they're doing if, if they're not doing any business we don't charge them anything but you know, I, I think the enforcement side of that will get. Well, we're not we're not providing what the of base is providing. We're what's what's the base providing? Their location. They, they, they don't have. Oh, to get, they're they selling have, their location. I I right, I, right. I, we, I we can't I, provide them with I, the location. I agree. We, I agree that they're selling the location. City Hall and possibly. And we're about, selling we're selling an opportunity also. I think we're making it so complicated that it's going to be you're going to pr provide enough barriers that it's not going to work anyway. You know, you, you're just making it just so hard. On a, food I, truck, I, I, on a food truck or trailer, don't they have to have that vehicle registered in North Carolina, the address on it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that's, that's verifiable. Very easy to verify. Yeah. I could not. I rent a post office box and have my uh, registration bill sent to me. My, I don't know if you had a street address. I don't know the answer to that, but that's just one thing that comes to mind, which is $100 a, a year. Lot of yeah. Pitfalls here and there. If, if, <laughs> if we feel like it's okay for the for the base to sell their location, I, then I think it's certainly okay for us to do the same, make the same sale. Maybe we don't charge as much. We're not we're not providing the location. They still have to acquire a location from a per, personal private owner. We're providing we're not, an opportunity. Well, you're going to make it. You're not going to provide the, much. The base has a very active group too. A bunch of twenty-two year olds. We're, we're not charging a, 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 t a tenth of what, uh, we're not even charging a, a twentieth or, 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 or so of what the base is charging. I mean, we're not even talking, you know, we're not even talking comparables. Well, I know our friend that used to sit right here moved his mess off the base because of the, the amount of money he was having to pay and what he was making in return right. business-wise just wasn't. I, I, I'm, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to, to go with what uh, Mr. Bittner, <clears throat> Councilman Bittner, Mayor Pro Tem has, has proposed. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, I think we need to give them opportunity, but I, I also think we need to make sure that they're paying whatever the cost so that we're not sharing it with with the non-users the rest of the citizens remind me what was the number second? you said do we have a second on that we have no it. all right well i'll second that and you can certainly five hundred dollars for non-resident and three hundred dollars for resident 
And you're going to, and again, we go back to the question, how are you going to determine that? We'll work that out. You're going to work that out? Yes, sir. Okay. That'll be an administrative policy, correct? Okay. We do it in recreation and how we, that would be one would, of the places yeah. we could look to. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have a second? Okay. Second. Any further discussion? I'll just say that I think it's probably a good compromise that now everybody's going to have a chance to buy six months worth. So that'll give them a chance to, to find, to test the waters in six months. If you find out that you had 75 sign up this month and 22 July 1st, right. how many, then, how you, many then, you, know, then right. you know what you've got. That's so right. it, it's, I'll, I'll, Hey, I, I don't look at this as a money maker for us. If it was a oh, money no, maker, no. What, what, we're, what, we're what, I to, what I want to provide What I want what I want to make sure is that we're we're covering our covering costs. Yeah, absolutely, we shouldn't be pushing that off on on our citizens. Right. Okay, so we have a motion and second, and all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. So gather myself here that does it for the agenda so we'll move on to the reports for this evening and we'll start down at your end mr mayor just proud to be here thank you proud to have you mr thomas uh, no report thank you mayor oh i'm sorry mr washington dr washington <laughs> mr jackson um i'm glad to be here you couldn't be here <laughs> uh, you know, I would like to think of something, you know, yesterday was considered celebration for Martin Luther King. And um, there's been a whole lot of uh, ugly things that's been happening in our country. And I hope we start trying to reach into our hearts and, and our souls to figure out who we want to be going forward. You know, we talk about unity. We talk about equity. But we can't even talk about love amongst our neighbors. So... Hopefully we could get to the point where we could celebrate each other and uh, love each other enough and, and decide that we want to be a country and move forward together. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Very well said. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'll give you a brief on Wassa report that Mr. Warden, Councilman Warden, will be sworn in to the on Wassa Board of Directors Thursday night. Tickets are in short supply, but if you <laughs> <laughs> walk the board. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, National Night Out Week 2020. Uh, Jacksonville Police Department addressed the challenges of the pandemic by holding a week of smaller community policing engagement activities. Events included the public safety vehicle parade at each of the elementary schools within the city, the selfie with a cop, and you see the video up there, selfie with a cop contest, the chat with the chief radio broadcast and the prayer vigil for unity, to name just a few. The National Night Out strengthens neighborhood spirit and police community partnerships. This week of smaller and virtual activities helped heighten awareness of crime and drug prevention and generate support and participation in local anti-crime efforts. This year, the National, National Association of Town Watch selected Jacksonville's National Night Out Celebration for the first place award nationally for communities with a population of 50 to 100,000. A small award ceremony was held with uh, Public Safety Director Chief Mike Unero and organizers of the National Night Out Week, Lieutenant Chris Funky, Sergeant Ashley, Sergeant Ashley Weaver, Deputy Chief Ashley Weaver, and Public Affairs coordinator Beth Purcell and here's the trophy that they received mm -hmm. yeah and they are the other young ladies it's Ashley Potter Ashley Potter she's a sergeant mm -hmm. yes it is okay. yeah Deputy Chief Weaver would be uh, uh, having a heart attack right now if you knew know. she had demoted her to a yes, sergeant I know. surprise surprise <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know though that Ashley uh, Ashley Weaver does get involved with the Absolutely. National Night Out program but anyway very nice trophy, very nice award. <coughs> Champion for Kids Award. We have Director of Public Safety, Mike Unero, was honored with a 2020 Champion for Kids Award from the organization Fight Crime. 
invest in kids. Mm -hmm. Chief Unero has been a member of the organization since 2008 and has long been an advocate for early childhood and after school programs in our community. There were only 18 recipients across the nation to receive the 2020 Champion for Kids Award. Congratulations to Chief Unero. Just uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Comment, uh, you know, this, this is the, the community involvement. This is the example that I think that, uh, that the chief uh, represents and, and sends a message, I think, to uh, members of his, of his police force, but also, I think, to, to the community that, uh, that uh, the, there's other ways of, of making a good, safe in, uh, community and, and certainly getting involved in, in these, these sort of activities that he's done so well, I think, speaks well to uh, his progressive thinking. I, I, I applaud him and uh, just wish him the best for that. Thank you. Very proud of the work that Chief Unero has done uh, yes, sir. as police chief, but also I'm very proud of the work of every man and woman associated with the city of Jacksonville Police Department because, you know, it's a team yeah. effort. It's, it, yes, there's no is. doubt about it. Nope. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have the Community Partner of the Year Award. Uh, and this goes, this went to Councilman Brian Jackson. Yeah. He's been selected to receive the IPS or Individual Placement and Support uh, Community Partner of the Year Award by the University of North Carolina Center for Excellence in Community Mental Health. This goes hand in hand with your most recent appointment, doesn't it, <laughs> Councilman Jackson? Sure does. Councilman Jackson has been a hard working advocate for persons with mental health and substance abuse uh, issues for many years. His advocacy includes working to connect those in our community who are struggling or have life challenges to the organizations and experts that can provide them with the assistance they need. Councilman Jackson received the award during a virtual ceremony on January 13, 2021. Congratulations, Council Member. Jackson for that award. Thank you. Thank you a whole lot. I just like connecting people to the experts and that's, you know, just like people have helped me, I like try to uh, keep on pushing it forward and keep on serving. Great work, great work. Thank you. So now we'll go to Dr. Woodruff <coughs> for your report. Mayor, members of council, uh, excellent discussion tonight. One of the great things that we as a staff have is a body that knows how to discuss and find solutions. So I commend each of you. It's a it's interesting when I look back, uh, Ryan has probably spent uh, the only other issue that he has spent more hours on than food trucks has been the successful operation down at Shoreline. <laughs> and Ryan is to be commended. If you haven't been by Shoreline, we now have, what, all three buildings down? All three buildings that we've purchased uh, have been demolished. Uh, the first, first buildings down to just dirt, and they were working on the second concrete today. And we are optimistic that we will close on the fourth and final building, hopefully by the end of this week. So we will have purchased all 16, which is what our goal was originally. So mm -hmm. um, we got the, all the payoffs today and uh, the attorney is in the process of working up the closing documents for that. So hopefully we'll close and then they will move right on from once they finish up the, the last two lots from the concrete, they'll move on to demolishing uh, that last unit, which is 82. Very good. But again, good ex excellent work. Ryan is to be commended because I can tell you he and John have literally spent uh, not just minutes, but days trying to negotiate and put all these parties together. Uh, the other thing we'd like to spend a moment on tonight is the vaccine. Uh, I believe we have a picture of a city employee being vaccinated. I think you know that smiling face. I'd like to encourage every citizen of the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County to be vaccinated. We know that as of the day, we've had over 3,000 citizens in our community vaccinated. I will tell you that the county through Sharon Russell and Sherry Slater and through the other folks at the health department have set up a very smooth operation. But I'd also remind all of our citizens of what they call the herd effect. Now herd isn't what you 
hear or heard, it's the group. And what we know in our reading is that for us to get away from this pandemic, we need to have somewhere in the vicinity, and Dr. Washington could certainly speak more eloquently on this than I with her medical background, but I believe the number is 75% of the herd needs to be vaccinated if we're going to eliminate this pandemic or address it. You can register at the county. There are numbers. You can go on the county's website. Uh, Ron can give us more information on that if you'd like. But the important thing is each of us as citizens need to decide, are we going to be vaccinated? I want to stress that no, as a city employer, we cannot mandate that any of our employees take the vaccine. I want to also assure the public that there's nothing that John has found in the law that allows you as a city government to mandate that every citizen take the vaccine. This is still America and we still have freedom of choice, but I will encourage every one of us to take the vaccine, but it's your choice. Again, I want to commend the county government for the outstanding job that they are doing <laughs> in providing this very smooth process. But again, after three weeks and having 3,000 people and a community of 200,000, this isn't going to be a process that is over in just another month. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your continued service. You're a great group to work with. John? Let me tag on, let me tag on to that just a minute. I know that they have uh, taken it down to 65 now as far as, you know, the order uh, of who can be vaccinated. And a lot of this is actually moving into some of the private uh, physicians' practices now that they're offering and, and starting to call some of their patients and offer this uh, vaccine to them too. Mr. Carter. I just wanted to give you an update on the fire station on Barn Street, okay. which all approved back in September timeframe to the sale. I have been working with the realtor and the uh, purchaser since then. Danny has been working with me. I've shown it to several uh, contractors as far as what would be needed to be do done and so forth. You have a commercial building in a residential zone. And banks just don't loan on that kind of conflicting thing. Of course, he's going to take the commercial building and turn it into a residence. <coughs> but he has been working with an, an internet uh, a mortgage company. And I got an email today from the realtor who says that closing is imminent, that he has been approved for the loan, and that hopefully by the end of the month we can have that closed and in ownership of this person to turn it into a residence. Now, we will let you know more as when that actually occurs, but again, that was just great news today. Very good. good news. That's my report. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Nobody has anything else. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye.